Okay, welcome everybody. Uh, I'm delighted to have you all back for the second day of our conference on Paul Oppe and the practice of art history in Britain in the first half of the 20th century. I hope today's discussions will, will evolve just as fruitfully as yesterday's proceedings and that we can build on the debates and insights uh, that we collected yesterday. Um, just a very brief overview of the program for today. Uh, the set of the, the academic session, if you want, this morning consists of three papers. Um, I will, of course, like yesterday, introduce the speakers individually. Uh, um, our theme this morning is, broadly speaking, careers on the margins. So um, the biographical side of how art historians try to establish a professional career without necessarily being part of one of the established institutional career pathways. So how did they map out their fortunes uh, in the absence of a clearly defined professional pathway that was to follow? Um, after that, uh, so that, that will occupy us throughout the morning. Uh, uh, at noon, uh, we will uh, split up in groups, those of you who are in the room, and um, have tours of, on the one hand side, the drawing room display, where I will guide you through some of the things that you've already heard yesterday. But we will also have the opportunity to go down to the study room and see some of the archival treasures from the Arpe archive that are not in, on display. And, and uh, Charlotte and Emma will also speak a bit more broadly about the archive and library collections, collection policies, and the way uh, that this archive has evolved um, and this resource has evolved over recent years. As this conference is testimony of, it's, it's clearly becoming a force to be reckoned with and a very serious resource that is, I think, starting to reshape our picture of art historiography in Britain quite substantially. So we're delighted to have the opportunity to delve further into that. Um, after lunch, we will then have a round table chaired by Sarah and myself, um, where we will, I think, very much workshoppy think about further directions for the study of British art historiography. So where does these proceedings today and yesterday, where do they take us? What comes next and how best to further uh, study this area? Um, so I very much look forward to that, but uh, first and foremost, I look forward to this morning's papers. And it is my great pleasure to introduce our first speaker, Sue Sloman, who is, of course, a well-known presence at the Paul Mellon Center, so I feel I don't need to introduce her extensively. She is, of course, a historian of British art, unsurprisingly, in this context. And I just want to highlight her most recent publications, in particular, the beautiful volume uh, on on Gainsborough in London that was published in 2021. More recently, she has also published, for example, on the infant drawings of Sir Thomas Lawrence and is currently working on a catalog of the Thomson Collection of British Portrait miniature, Miniatures uh, and in the Art Gallery of Ontario. The title apparently is yet to be determined, even though the book is scheduled to come out next year, so I'm sure the publisher is keenly waiting for the definitive uh, title here. Um, but today she is going to speak about one of these forgotten art historians that shaped art historiography in Britain so decisively, G.C. Williamson. And with that, I hand over to you, Sue. Well, thank you very much, and thank you for that kind introduction, and it's really lovely to be here, and I'm so pleased this conference has been so well supported, and yesterday was wonderful. We learnt a huge amount, and I hope some of what I'm saying is going to build on things that we heard yesterday, and certainly I was struck by how much the dates, the sort of key dates, seem to coincide across the whole field. So um, we've been thinking about how um, art historians... Uh, made a living, and um, <clears throat> some, such as G.C. Williamson, made themselves into so-called experts using publishing as a tool, and in particular, technical advancements in photographic reproduction. And before photography, obviously, art books relied on uh, line engravings or mezzotints, neither of which um, could be produced in quantity or really show, um, uh, to show paintings, uh, they were never completely satisfactory. 
Um, pho photo photography and photogravure printing changed everything, but it took about 40 to 50 years. Um, and the key names I'm going to be referring to, I've put up on the screen because they're not all necessarily very familiar to us um, today. And both Williamson and Roger Fry worked for the American collector J.P. Morgan in the first decade of the 20th century. And it's clear that the art market was as important to art historians as the publishing industry. And indeed, uh, the two were intertwined. Um, going back to 1858, the year that Williamson was born, the art dealers Cornagi and Agnew produced a souvenir of the 1857 Manchester Art Treasures exhibition, the first publication of its kind, illustrated by the Italian photographers Caldesi and Montecchi, who had based themselves in uh, London. And in, you can, if you want to see all the photographs that they um, printed for this souvenir, there's, there's a very good online record of it on the Royal Collection website. So pasted in photographs were soon superseded by phot photogravure reproductions made by specialist photographers such as J. Hallett Hyatt of Oxford Street and Dickinson's of New Bond Street, um, all, of course, in monochrome. And by 1906, Williamson was engaged on what he later regarded as the highlight of his career, his four-volume catalogue of portrait miniatures in the Pierpont Morgan collection. This is a, a lavishly illustrated with photogravure plates by Hallett Hyatt. And out of 150, a total of 150 sets of this book, um, 40 were printed on Japanese vellum, which is a, a very smooth um, handmade paper. And, and they had 129 of the plates within that deluxe set. 129 of the plates were duplicated and hand colored and gilded by what was described as a little army of some 50 artists. The set, um, sh this set shown here fetched, as you can see, 25,000 pounds at auction. Um, and I think none of us are ever going to achieve that with any, any of our books. Um, most, most copies um, were given by Morgan to, uh, well, in fact, they were all given away rather than sold. So, um, most were given to uh, heads, of, heads of state, museums, and libraries. And some he gave to friends, which is why they occasionally do appear on the market, but it's quite rare. Um, so Morgan's collections were, were at this time in London as well as New York. Um, and he inherited the house on the left here, um, 13 Prince's Gate from his father, and then he managed to buy the house next door in 1904, which was the year he became, also the year that he became president of the Metropolitan Museum. And in England, Morgan appointed as advisors Roger Fry in, in 1905 and G.C. Williamson in 1906. And as befitted the very different characters of these men, Fry's job was to, uh, to think big, to formulate ideas for the Met, as well as for Morgan's own collection. Well, Williamson was to produce sumptuous catalogues. And Fry was um, a university man, an apostle, and um, at, at Cambridge University, he was an intimate friend of the writer and philosopher Goldsworthy Lois Dickinson, who, as it happens, was a scion of the Dickinson family of publishers um, that we've already mentioned in New, New Bond Street. Um, Williamson, by contrast, um, appears to have had very little formal education. <clears throat> and he does not seem to have been entitled to the doctor or delit that he habitually added to his name. Um, he was born into a family of furniture makers 
in Guildford. And his father, who really wanted to be a pharmacist, was a reluctant managing director of the company of William Williamson and Sons. And G.C. Williamson himself, um, when he inherited with two brothers, he inherited the company, he was equally reluctant um, and eventually um, managed to free himself and become a writer and self-styled art expert. Um, Williamson's was actually um, a perfectly respectable company um, with a history that went back to 1720 and a royal appointment. And in the 19th century, it produced high quality reproduction furniture. And I mean, this is a piece that sold recently and marked pieces, people, pieces marked with the Williamson name still fetch um, high prices. It's noticeable um, that G.C. Williamson never ever mentions the nature of the family firm in any of his three published memoirs. Occasionally, he refers to the disagreeable inconvenience of business, but nothing more. What he does mention, um, <clears throat> somewhat oddly, is the occupation of his maternal grandfather, a Mr. Rutter, who, who practiced as a mesmerist in Brighton. And as a young boy, Williamson spelt, spent much time in the Rutter household, and he was proud to count himself one of those special individuals whose personal electricity, or what was called the odic force, was manifested through the galvanoscope, an instrument which had been invented in Germany and was used by Rutter for, during consultations with psychiatric patients. And Rutter was part showman, uh, part pseudo-scientist. And Williamson claimed that Rutter knew and even conducted experiments with Michael Faraday and William Henry Fox Talbot. Um, Rotter's long room uh, was, on the, was at Black Rock on the seafront at Kemp Town in Brighton. And the attractions there included an aquarium fed by seawater and a reading room. And the frontispiece to Rutter's human electricity, which you see here, shows Williamson's Aunt Sophie demonstrating um, the galvanoscope. In 1885, when he was, when he was 27, so not, not that young, he's, he was still nominally involved in the furniture business, Williamson visited the London art collection of John Lumsden Propert. Uh, this was a private collection, but people could visit uh, by appointment. Um, so this visit and Will, um, Propert's own catalogue for which um, you can see the title page here, um, which was published the following year. This, Williamson says, inspired him to make a career in the art world. Um, Propert was a successful me medical doctor, a competent amateur artist. There are some of his etchings in the British Museum. Um, a, a bit major collector and one of the prime movers behind the 1889 exhibition of miniatures organized by the Burlington Fine Arts Club. Um, and this is um, a page to show that, th that this um, catalog had very high quality um, illustrations and it was, um, the text was written by Propert. By, by 1894, having made that decision to, to, um, to try and make a living in the art world, by 1894, Williamson had published his first monograph, um, which was on the pastel painter John Russell. That's the book on the left here. And John Russell had been born in Guildford, so um, Williamson uh, ha had access to material which um, hadn't been used before. And... Um, so it was, a, it was a good book for him to start off with because he was familiar with the background history. 
1895, a year later, he visited um, the convent at Lodi near Milan in Italy in search of material for a book on Richard Cosway. Um, and the Cosway book and others that followed, including um, the book on the right here, on the, the Plymers, were published by George Bell, Bell and Sons. And it was Bell in long term that became um, the most important publisher in his career. Until um, 1898, the art editor at Bell's was a, a man called Joseph Gleason White, who was a distinguished writer and designer and the second editor of the studio magazine. And after Gleason White's premature death, Williamson became Bell's commissioning editor for this um, Great Masters series. And Bell's became the regular publisher of his own books. Uh, and this just gives you a title of some of the first books in the Great Masters um, series. There were eventually well over 30 titles, ranging from Italian early Renaissance subjects to David Wilkie. And Williamson himself wrote several of the books in the series. Each, they were standardized. Each book had 40 illustrations and sold for five shillings. At the same time, um, Williamson edited Bell's uh, pocket-sized miniature series. These were called miniature series because of the size of the book, not the um, subject. And these two took advantage of Bell's tradition of uh, stylish um, book design. Um, these covers um, were designed by Gleason White um, before, his, before his death. And each book had eight illustrations, um, and it was sold at two prices, either one shilling for this um, version or two shillings for a leather binding. And they were the sort of book you could put in your pocket and, and take on a train and could be seen as a way of democratizing art history. And for me, they're actually one of the most positive of Williamson's achievements. But interestingly, and I can only put this down to snobbery, he um, doesn't use his own name for this small book, um, but uses um, a, a pseudonym. Um, Bells um, had acquired the upmarket printers, the Chiswick Press, in 1880. And it was this press, in, in collaboration with the photographer J. Hallett Hyatt, that rose to the challenge of producing catalogues of J.P. Morgan's collections. And Williamson was responsible for um, the portrait miniatures catalogues, uh, jewels, small sculptures, and watches. And as you can see here, the, the deluxe edition had um, plates, selected plates, that, that were not just washed with a tint of, of watercolor, but were so solidly painted over the um, photogravure and set within wash lines as if they were um, watercolors, really. Um, Williamson's catalogue of watches also had gilded and silvered plates. So the, the gilding you can see on this, um, on the frame here, is actual gilding in, in the book. <clears throat> um, but interestingly, this supposed miniature by Samuel Cooper, which is so um, carefully reproduced, was actually not an original <laughs> It was actually a copy, um, although Williamson catalogued it as the real thing. Um, the Morgan collection, collection of miniatures um, did contain some real treasures, and um, since um, Holbein is very much in the air at the moment with the exhibition at the uh, Queen's Gallery, um, I just thought I'd show you um, this Holbein, famous Holbein, which was um, in the catalogue and um, correctly described. Um, 
so one of the sort of one of the genuine treasures in in the Morgan collection. <clears throat> the first two volumes of the miniatures set were devoted to British works, and it's evident from Williamson's introductory essay that he intended to bookend the British collection with an example by Holbein and one by an eminent pre-Raphaelite. Uh, and it's at this point, really, with the whole structure of, of the book and the collection that things um, start to fall apart, as Williamson's desire to create a narrative uh, seems to have overridden his visual judgment. Um, this object had the distinction of being number one in volume one, um, but it's not, um, as he stated, a portrait by Holbein, and nor is it of the astronomer Nicholas Kratzer. Um, here it is. Um, <laughs> it's now in the um, Whipple Museum of the History of Science in Cambridge, where they are fully aware that it's not what it was um, said to be. <clears throat> it was one of the Whipple Museum's curators in the mid-1950s who started questioning a number of objects that had been acquired by the unsuspecting Robert Whipple. And the, 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 the objects were mostly... Um, the, su the suspect objects were mostly scientific instruments, but included this um, portrait. And already when, in 1935, when Morgan's miniatures were auctioned, this was called School of um, Holbein, rather than Holbein, but now um, it's acknowledged that it's probably, um, at best, late 19th century. Um, and note the frame, which um, is different to the frame that's in the, uh, illustrated in the catalogue, so it was changed at some point. And I don't know, uh, in this case, whether Williamson was responsible, um, but he certainly was responsible for framing the last object in the British section of the Morgan catalogue, the supposed pre-Raphaelite, and, and I should say here that the story of this object has been fully documented by Joe Briggs of the Walters Art Museum, where it now resides. And I'll give you the reference at the end of, for, to, to her excellent article. Um, what Joe Briggs did not have time to discuss in, f in full is the way in which this uh, book ended with the Holbein, this book ended the Morgan catalogue and collection, and how it relates to another George Bell publication. Um, so in a nutshell, Williamson makes this the last catalogue entry and describes it as a miniature by Dante Gabriel Rossetti of his wife, Elizabeth Siddle. And Briggs shows that it's actually a carte de visite photograph of an unidentified woman. Um, <laughs> with rather crudely applied colour. The woman's pose amalgamates elements of Rossetti's two paintings of Beata Beatrix, the second of which, uh, featuring the crossed hands, is actually based on Jane Morris rather than Elizabeth Siddle. And Williamson would have known both images because in 1889, Bells had published a substantial book on Rossetti by... Um, H.C. Marillier, who was a French scholar, including reproductions of both those paintings. And Williams himself says in his memoirs how much he admired Marillier as a person and the Rossetti book. Back in 1906, Williamson um, constructed a provenance for what he calls the Rossetti miniature, and he arranged its framing. And over time, he um, provided several different versions of the provenance, um, all very uh, Dickensian in character very, and very dramatic. And he writes almost as if he was present when the object was made. 
1936, when he sent a series of articles to Country Life, he does, for the first time, call the image a photograph. But he then describes how Rossetti, in a frenzy of grief, sitting at Siddle's deathbed, tore the photograph out of an album and colored it in order to try and record her appearance. Somehow, his work for Morgan allowed Williamson to move into the very grand Burr House in Hampstead, um, where he had Gertrude Jekyll design his garden and where he hung his own collection, a catalogue which he produced in 1909, again printed by the um, Chiswick Press. At the same time, um, coincidentally, Roger Fry was also living in Hampstead, but he was in a rather more modest uh, 22 Willow Road. And the last of Williamson's Morgan catalogues was published in, eight, in 1912 and was of watches. And like the, the miniatures, it had, the, in this case, 20 copies on Japanese vellum, hand-colored and gilded and silvered. Again, with plates by Hallett Hyatt and a copy of that catalogue sold for $81,000 at Christie's in 2015. So people who are interested in watches still very much want to own that. Um, exactly how Williamson benefited from his association with Morgan is not clear. And one would need to delve into the archive at the Morgan Library um, to get a fuller picture. But he certainly seems to have made more money than any, anyone could have made um, by just being paid to write catalogues. And it's striking that a rather similar journalist art historian called Charles Lewis Hind has recently been shown to have participated in a complicated and secret financial deal with Agnews to, produce, to purchase Velasquez Roqueby Venus for the National Gallery. And again, there's a very good article on this in the Burlington magazine. Um, now, that, that deal happened in 1905 to 06. So it's exact, at exactly the same period um, that Williamson is um, working for um, Morgan. And his lifestyle is suddenly changed so dramatically. So it appears that the art market must have played a major role in the lives of both Hind and Williamson. And in fact, these two men knew each other. They even went to the same school. Around 1912, Williamson appears to have grown anxious about future employment. Um, Morgan was aging and in fact died in 1913. And in 1912, Williamson got wind of a planned publication on Samuel Cooper and the miniaturists of the 17th century by J.J. Foster. And this was a subject that Williamson regarded as his own and by extension, Bell's own. And Foster had acquired the rival printer publishers, Dickinson's, which was as capable as Bell's of producing high quality reproductions. And in a move that smacks of paranoia, Williamson penned letters to several owners and agents, advising them not to allow their miniatures to be photographed for Foster's book. And several of their responses are tipped into Williamson's own copy of Foster's book, which did, of course, get published. Um, Bell's exist existed in various guises until 1989, long after Williamson's death. But his connection effectively ended with the First World War when it became unrealistic to produce expensive art books. Um, but he continued to reminisce and write about miniatures and produced um, books on Zoffany and Angelica Kaufman for the publisher John Lane in 1920 and 1924. Both of these in collaboration with Lady Victoria Manners. And perversely, when writing in hindsight about miniatures and his work for Morgan, he often focused on works that must already have been discredited, such as the Rossetti 
and these two um, supposed causeways. Um, within this, this is his 1925 memoir, he even um, reproduces, you can see on the right-hand page, the spurious inscription on the back of one of these miniatures. And unlike, unlike somebody like Paul Oppe, who spent decades mulling over the artist Alexandra and uh, J.R. Cousins before committing himself to paper, Williamson rattled through more subjects than anyone could possibly man master. And um, his judgments became increasingly outlandish. <coughs> I have kept wondering whether his whether his eyesight was defected, <laughs> defective, whether he was excessively gullible or was a little mad or bad. In the end, it seems to me that like his maternal grandfather, Williamson believed the myths that he himself created. And here is the extraordinary portrait he commissioned of himself as El Greco. Um, so, as you can see, it's entitled Portrait of the Author, as he was seen by El Greco in 1578. Um, revisaged, I don't know whether that's the word, but it's there, revisaged in London in 1910 by Vernon Hill. Um, the reference to 1578 and Toledo must point um, to uh, El Greco's... Uh, burial of Count Orgath, which includes a self-portrait, um, the third head from the left there. And, does, and this painting does bear the date, 1578, although we now know it's not actually the date when the picture was painted. Um, so it was apparently Robert Ross, um, Oscar Wilde's friend and literary executor, who pointed out Williamson's El Greco type of face. But the idea for, the port, for this portrait and its use as a frontispiece comes from Charles Lewis Hind, the journalist associated with the Rope Venus. Um, <clears throat> and as the frontispiece to his fictional tale, The Education of an Artist, published in 1906, Hind uh, printed an, an Italian 16th century portrait of an unknown man who, he claims, is the double of his hero, Claude Williamson Shaw. Hines' hero, you will notice, has Williamson as his, his middle name. His first name refers to Claude Phillips, a writer and art critic, and his last name to George Bernard Shaw. Um, now, I, I, I'm going to leave you with this image because it does, it does sort of speak volumes, I think. And I've only really sort of cratched, scratched the surface of this, but what I will just put up on the screen is um, the reference to Joe Briggs' um, article because um, that's, that's really where you'll find this solid information. Thank you. Thank you for a fascinating paper. Um, as yesterday, we're going to have questions for all papers of that session at the end. Um, so please do uh, keep your question in mind uh, until a little later. Uh, I'm delighted to uh, introduce our second speaker this morning. Uh, again, whom I don't need to introduce at length because she has chaired already yesterday, so it should be a known face. Emily Oleron Evans is um, an art historian. Uh, based at Queen Mary's uh, University of London, where she's seen a lecturer in French, which is a fascinating combination in its own right. Uh, she has published very widely about art historiography, cultural transfers, and the question of translation in art writing. Uh, her first book uh, was on Nicholas Pevsner, uh, in particular his role as science communicator and his, his work for the BBC. And forthcoming later this year, fingers crossed, the time is running out, is, uh, is, is, is a new monograph on Linda Nocklin and her reception uh, mainly in the Francophone world. I should also mention that she will be a very shortly PI on a collaborative project grant uh, funded by the Paul Mellon Center for a collaboration with the University of Aberdeen for a project on women making art history. And we are also hearing today about the role of women for the discipline. So Emily. Please. Thank you. Yeah. 
I am very pleased to be here, and I'd like to thank the organizers again. It's been a wonderful um, exchange of uh, ideas and overlaps of different worlds uh, so far, um, and I, I see connections emerging uh, as, we, as we go, so I'll try to make my contribution to these uh, world-building exercise. Um, with a paper entitled The Rise of the Picture Researcher, Women, Art Historians and Visual Literacy in Post-War Britain. Um, and I will be weaving together testimonies and memories of three women in particular, Ruth Rosenberg, Hilde Kurz and Eva feuchtwang norad What they have in common is uh, their personal situation of immigrés seeking refuge from national socialism in Britain. Their, um, interest in art history, whether uh, it's backed up by academic training or not, and their employment for um, a company, a packaging company called Adprint, um, either temporarily or um, officially uh, in the capacity of picture researcher. Um, Extend research on the history of art publishing already exists, including Anna Nybuk's groundbreaking book, Emigres, and it has suggested that the role, indeed the profession of picture researcher, as it came to be understood, was shaped in part by the work of the Ad Prince team, uh, which employed many women, uh, many of them uh, Central European exiles. So picture researchers, um, as I'll try to demonstrate, seems to be a gendered profession. And um, I'm using the um, intellectual framework shaped by uh, Heidi Eggington and Do Zoe Thomas's work on um, women uh, in employment, the sort of history of precarious professionals, as they called them in their essay collection. Um, and um, we want to survey how professional recognition could be claimed, adapted, and denied by historical subjects at different moments. And as I hope you will see in these examples, these are various facets um, recognizable in the testimonies or in the experiences of the free women I'm talking about. Um, when we look at um, the history of the discipline from the point of view of professions, it opens discussion to um, and fosters an understanding of the power and expertise that having a professional position uh, grants in, in public life or doesn't grant uh, in some respects. Um, arguably, also, as many studies of the trajectory of emigre art refugees um, um, or refugee scholars have shown, Women professionals um, who trained in art history, so most often abroad because institutionally the subject wasn't um, established, as we've said many times, um, people who were seeking employment in Britain in their own discipline faced even more severe constraints than their male counterparts. Uh, some of them, when they ended up being high in subsidiary roles or in roles that represented for them an a departure from their field of expertise, experience a loss of their professional sense of self as art historians. Um, and uh, apparently in ad, ad print, people, people who worked there were quite ill-paid, um, and uh, the women especially so, as was customary um, at the time in the publishing trade, plus ça change. Um, it could also be said and we want to explore this possibility as well, that female-dominated networks active in publishing and in book packaging, so through the example of ad print, carved out a new space for their art historical skills. So we'll see a balance and a various combination through these examples. So I'm going to start with uh, talking through um, the memories of Ruth Rosenberg, um, who is quoted um, in an interview in 1991 saying, you know, my mother was right. I think I got a job at Adprint because of that d -feel. Um And so she was also interviewed for the British Library Sound Archive project on artists' lives, uh, which I accessed, uh, fortunately, before the great uh, chaos that ensued after a cyber attack. Um, so... 
Rosenbank was born in 1905, and she studied in Freiburg, Berlin, and Munich. Her PhD was supervised by Wilhelm Pinder, um, who some of you may know for his sulfurous and um, notorious <coughs> reputation of having been close politically to the Nazi regime. Um, this is very clearly nuanced and unpacked uh, in Marlitte Albesmart's biography of Pinder. Um, but what can be uh, said factually is what, that he was a staunch defender of German art. And he was also instrumental, despite being a, a very prominent uh, scholar and erudite, um, instrumental in the popularization of art history through the production of art books uh, in the Blaubücher, the Blue Books series. So more of that uh, later. Um, Rosenberg learned the publishing trade at Ulstein, at the picture center of the Berliner Illustrierte, which she uh, calls the first illustrated paper ever invented. And um, so I want to quote some of passages of this interview. Um, I would have um, loved to like, give you her voice and the extracts, but we'll have to wait for the British Library to reopen. So imagine I'm Ruth Rosenberg. I can't do her justice, but... The photographers brought the material all first to the Berliner Illustrator, and there were two experienced women and me coming from university, and one had to see all the stuff and sieve it. I learned a lot. I learned how to see pictures, also to see from a journalistic point of view the importance of pictures, to remember pictures. So now my visual memory seems to be very strong. But it was not good enough, and I started for myself a card index. And she uses card index to um, put piece together uh, when um, a similar topic came up, the images that she's already uh, catalogued or seen. So all this is very important as a backdrop to her work in ad print. She arrived in England in 1939 and trained first to become factory worker. So we, we talked about precarity and um, embodied scholarship. Well, her uh, art, artistry degree wasn't uh, of much value when she arrived. So she, and she had to make a living coming completely um, uh, on her own uh, in England. Uh, so she was employed in a factory, then she um, trained as a frame maker, um, and by chance, so this is a reference to the Warburg Institute coming up, uh, she got an interview for a secretarial job with Adprint via someone she knew from the Warburg Institute. Um, so this is what she says about the interview. I cannot type, I don't know shorthand, so I was not the perfect secretary. But the interviewer was such a decent person, she had made up her mind she had to do something. We talked and she said, you know, you have to see our production manager, which was uh, Walter Neurath, the, the later founder of Thames and co-founder of Thames and Hudson. The story is, because of history of art, I got the job. So uh, Walter Neurath was impressed uh, by her degree um, and, uh, and got her a job. Um, so her mother was right, as she says, in uh, convincing her to, to pursue a a postgraduate degree. So um, this is how Rosenberg describes at print in her own words. They produced books. It was a very ingenious invention. They produced books for other publishers. Um, and uh, the packaging company, as defined by David Lambert in any, any study of at print, uh, is about planning, producing an illustrated book that will be sold for an agreed price to a publisher who stocks and marks it. It, um, it involves commissioning an author and artists or photographers who work with an in-house team of editor, designers, and picture researchers. Um, and my, my, my focus here will be on um, Britain in Pictures, um, the, the series that Rosenberg called very ingenious. It was a fantastic series created during the war, she said. For very little money, you could give very nice gifts. We're coming up to Christmas. So. And it went back to a German series, the Blaubücher. That was the idea that was taken over. Um, she mentions um, a colleague called Mary Patton, who was editor and also did a bit of production. Um, who, um, oh, of course, she says, 
Of course, there was no question of being secretary, actually. Um, but uh, I did picture research, and Mary introduced me to uh, the task. So if we were tempted to see a pattern of foreign scholars coming to Britain and uh, influencing local practices, we need to nuance it. It was actually, uh, even if Rosenberg came with her wealth of experience uh, through the Berliner Illustrator, with her PhD, um, she learned on the job to be a picture researcher in dialogue with uh, her British colleagues. And she said, but there is still a difference in status, as she describes. It was very difficult to do picture research for the series because the museums were not accessible and, and the libraries, the London Library, Cambridge and Oxford, the only thing I knew for this job was how to use a library, but nothing else, just being modest here. Um, so Britain in Pictures is an interesting case study in the symbolism that the collection entails of a a cultural war effort, a demonstration of the soft power of, of images. So I have a couple of e examples to illustrate. There is uh, this English Cities and Small Towns by John Betjeman that has uh, the wonderful opening line. Not until you have been away from it do you realize how friendly, how beautiful is the meanest English town. I, hope you, I, hear, I hear agreement in the room. Um, and Life Among the English by um, Rose McCulley um, contained, so the, the work of the picture researchers is here apparent in the selection of drawing by war artists. So they were supporting a network of artists um, up and coming, not, not only uh, finding in libraries historical uh, images, but also uh, either commissioning or supporting the work of, um, of artists. So you have, um, doo -doo 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 -doo. You have Anthony Gross, um, Social Life in Wartime on the, on the left, and a drawing by Henry Moore called, uh, from a series called Modern Interior Scene on the, on the right. So the picture researchers was just, were essential in uh, structuring the connections between the text and images in the books. Uh, as well as selecting them. Uh, but imagine having to procure illustrations and to do picture research on books that contain such statements as I'm quoting from the, um, the last page. Provincial social life, meanwhile, was complicated and somewhat embittered by evacuees from raided cities whose habits proved often unpleasing to the natives and refugees from conquered lands who also did not invariably give satisfaction to patriots. In these areas, conversation tended to turn on the attributes and practices of one or other of these two groups. Um, and we have it from Rosenberg's interview that uh, her experience were sometimes difficult. Um, she says, when I went to Cambridge to the Fitzwilliam, whoever was the director there said to me, I do not know why people like you are doing this work when our people are fighting. And um, she, she says, she replied, I wanted to fight, but they didn't let me. Um, so, yeah, they, oops, sorry, these women refugees were um, considered uh, in the margins of, of society as well as in professional margins. Um, and so to, to finish on, on Rosenberg, she, she uh, said also in that interview from 1991 uh, that while she hunted through libraries for illustrations, I would begin juxtaposing the pictures in my head, but then the designers wouldn't use them the way I saw them. And uh, a co-worker told them, well, stop grumbling and start designing. So um, we have the, here the making of her transition from picture researcher to, to really book design. Um, and I want to move on to, to Hilde Kurz um, to give a sort of a different note um, about um, having to carve a place for yourself and a different approach. Uh, Hilde Kurz was an Austrian art historian who trained in Vienna, uh, like her husband Otto. Uh, they both got their doctorate from Julius, with Julius from Schlosser. And as uh, Otto Kurz left for London uh, in 1934, accompanying the Warburg Library, Hilde followed later. Um, they had very di diverging paths. Um, he was able to pursue his career 
as an art historian, um, but while she, she had to take a position at, at print to, to earn a living. Um, and um, I guess I, I added this, the following anecdote that is quoted in uh, Nyberg's essay on the court's archive in reference to a discussion we had yesterday. Hilde mentioned in a letter to her sister Ilse in June 1938 that Kenneth Clark had asked her to compile the index for his book on Leonardo da Vinci, and she says she was not paid for the job until May 1939. I quote, the first index brought in 12 pounds, it arrived today, with the excuse that it had taken Sir Kenneth so long to find out the correct amount. And this is one of the richest men in England and is supposed to be as elegant as he is distinguished. So um, this is um, the translation from Niebuhr's essay. Yeah, so um, Quartz made very rare uh, allusions to her job in correspondence or the material. Um, according to her daughter, um, um, Erica Barrett, she did not keep anything related to having been in ad print. And, we can wonder whether it was out of intellectual modesty or, um, yeah, I'm, I'm speculating about the idea of feeling like you're squandering your intellectual skills and doing something that is not particularly rewarding intellectually. Uh, I just wanted to give you, um, maybe it's not on, it's not fair on Pinter Hansen, but I wanted to quote the uh, part of the British Sea Fisherman uh, volume. Most people have only the vaguest idea of how the fish they eat is caught or of the light of the men who catch it. Perhaps this little book will give them a better appreciation of the sea fishermen of Britain. This is why it, was, uh, it has been Britain. So I am aware that I'm giving intonations that suggest that it's not a particularly <laughs> scholarly, um, you know, challenging book. And so we can understand why Hilde Kurz um, said, um, according to her daughter, Erika Barrett, um, about Britain in pictures, it was a hack work uh, and she refused to have her name printed, uh, printed in the ad, ad print production. It did allow her to bring an, in an income and to support other, other refugees, other artist friends of hers, like the designer Bettina Ehrlich or the Polish artist um, um, Katarina Wilczynski, um, of whom you can see a drawing uh, on that page. So uh, Rosenberg and Kurz collected their own library of illustration. They browsed through second-hand uh, bookshops. Um, like, I, like we saw, they, they asked their friends um, for, for drawings or commissioned them. And little by little, they accumulated actual um, illustration archives um, that, um, that became the sort of core of um, in-house uh, picture collections. And indeed, Rosenberg took her collection with her when she started working at Thames and Hudson. Um, so to, to introduce Eva Neurath, uh, I thought I would just give you two illustrations to, to show the range of um, in, in which uh, building, uh, sorry, uh, Britain in pictures operated. Uh, from John Piper's British Romantic Artist to Margaret Lambert's and Enid Marx's English Popular and Traditional Art. So I'll get back to it. Oh, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> I'll get back to it in a second. Um, Eva Neurath, so Eva Feuchtwank Neurath, emigrated with her then husband, Wilhelm Feuchtwank, who was interned as enemy alien on the Isle of Man during the war. And uh, to get out of internment uh, was offered the possibility of joining the army, which he, he took. And by doing that, um, uh, Eva, as his wife, uh, the status she had changed from enemy alien. Uh, enemy alien. She was then allowed to uh, take an, uh, on employment, and she was hired at at print. Um, so, as she writes in her memoir. Um, the books were attractively designed and the subjects were documented by illustrations in the text. So I, I like this turn of phrase because uh, it illustrates sorry, uh, what is at the core of the picture researcher task. It's not merely, uh, the illustrations not merely complement, they, uh, they are also part of the documentation. They are part of the, of the subject. Uh, she says she worked on the Britain in Picture series and learned how to make layouts, and she was sent out to do picture research. 
Uh, unlike Rosenberg or Kurz, she did not have any art historical training. Instead, uh, she, she had an eye and uh, she developed on the job an astute practice of integrating images and texts. Um, her experience of art publishing in England was that it was rather inconspicuous. Certainly here and there, books on art and art history appeared, but it was still rather innovative and indeed risky to produce illustrated, finely printed luxury books. Um, so um, that's an endeavor that um, Walter Neurath and, and, and she um, tried from 1949 when they um, founded um, Thames and Hudson. Um, so I just wanted to go through some of the pages of um, Lambert and Marx's English popular and traditional art to, to illustrate this idea of uh, enhancing visual literacy uh, that doesn't have necessarily to be on topics of like fine art, but it's really also opening new, um, new avenues for, uh, for scholarship, as, as modest as these little books were, they contain such uh, statements that we, we would not only agree, but welcome today uh, in, in researching visual arts. So the blurb on the left says, popular art is the art which ordinary people have created for their own lives, by contrast to the fine arts made for special patrons. It covers a wider field than the arts and crafts, which are confined exclusively to handwork, and can equally well manifest itself in machine-made things when the right spirit pervades the design. For the general public, it gives, as nothing else can, an intimate picture of the feelings and sympathies, likes and dislikes, of many generations of ordinary English people. So this book, among the Britain in Pictures series, it, uh, shows how the... Um, the art was brought to the people, and there is a process of democratization uh, at play here as well. Um, so, um, I'm going back to this image of um, Eva Neurath um, to, to quote Tom Rosenthal, in a, um, so who titled an essay on the Neurath couple and Thames and Hudson in Immigrant Publishers. Their books, Married Words with Pictures. And indeed, um, this is what I've noticed in the self-definition of picture researchers. Their task was to just do that, um, value as high, equally highly the process by which we um, experience images um, combined with uh, text and not just as secondary. Um, so I have a few uh, words of uh, conclusions. Um, so Brian Mills said about ad print and Britain in pictures that it was a phenomenal success due to a combination of accessible scholarship and attractive presentation. And upon first reading this quote, one might think that there is a hierarchy that presentation would come after in the service of as an illustration of ideas. But I hope we've seen here that the contribution of these women was to establish the picture researcher as a central protagonist, one that practices presentation of images as a form of scholarship, deliberately generating knowledge and reactions. They contributed to major innovations in the visual appearance of books and embedded in publishing practices as demonstrated through the work of Thames and Hudson, um, the pedagogical benefits of a carefully designed text image relationship. They enable the crucial articulation between art scholarship and art popularization that this new profession represented through the selection and the dissemination of images that enhance the public taste for art and democratized art historical education. Collaborating with artists, photographers, and illustrators, they transpose their scholarly methods and curatorial strategies, albeit in an ad hoc manner, um, um, at first, maybe, but act actually increasingly professionally prompting the creation of in-house picture archives and uh, prompting also the development of um, yeah, picture archive as a practice, as a scholarly practice. Um, yes, well, that's my concluding statement. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much, Emily. Um, 
I uh, will directly continue with introducing the last speaker uh, of this morning, also because the time is progressing mercilessly, I'm afraid, um, but um, I'm sure we're all still still fascinated by what we're hearing, so um, all good on that front. Um, Jeffrey Lieber uh, is our final speaker in this panel. He is an associate professor at Texas State University, which he joined a few years ago after a, while, after a time as visiting professor at Harvard. Um, he has has worked, or he's, he's published and lectured widely, I will just mention his monograph from 2018, Flintstone Modernism, or the Crisis in Postwar American Culture, which is a most intriguing title, uh, and, and, and a book that touches on subjects such as Hollywood films, uh, the fate of the classical tradition, and post-war anxieties. Today, though, he is going to speak about, in, in my view, one of the most intriguing uh, uh, characters in British art historiography, Roger Hinks. So, Geoffrey, thank you. Come. Oh, sorry. I, I should have started clapping for you. Thanks, Hans. <clears throat> Good morning. My talk focuses on a nearly forgotten figure, Roger Hinks. If Hinks is known today at all, it is more as a diarist than an art historian. I discovered him during the pandemic while reading James Lee's Milner's diaries. In a mingled measure, in an entry from 1972, Lees Milna offers a cruel but truthful description of both Hinks and his diaries. I think it's worth quoting here as a means of introduction. Ian McCallum tells me that Roger Hinks' diaries are at last to be published, or rather, the four million words have been condensed by their editor to one volume. Ian says that Roger kept the diary all his life. There is no sequence apart from chronological, for it is not concerned with events nor with gossip. Hardly any reference to personalities, which is a surprise, for he was an extremely spiky, chippy man who could be devastatingly rude. I found him alarming. He was exceedingly ugly, <laughs> with a stiff, starch, pursed lip, prissy manner. Ian says the diaries are, in fact, freely written synopses of all the books which he never wrote. <laughs> the best extracts are those written when he was unhappy, in capitals which he disliked living in, Athens and Paris. Then he retreated into himself and wrote from the heart. Ian says he was a marvelous friend, loyal and generous. In fact, the edited volume, titled The Gymnasium of the Mind, appeared 12 years later in 1984. There is a foreword by Kenneth Clark, which for me enlarges the mystery surrounding Hinks and deepens his allure. Here's a quote. In middle life, when at the height of his powers, he became the victim of an abominable intrigue which forced him to leave his beloved British Museum. He wrote several admirable studies, but never the book which was to have been his masterpiece, a study of the decline of the classical style and its transformation into the Romanesque. Roger was a superb stylist, clear and at times eloquent. This selection of his writings shows that art history can be a form of literature. I was instantly gripped by the notion that Hinks and his diaries were part of a secret history of art history, and by the notion that he had been victimized and that his career suffered as a result. I soon realized that his life, which was spent in elite British institutions and quasi-exile abroad, offered a narrative worth rediscovering. 
not only for his unusual writings, but also for the object lesson it provides of the risks and the severities of pursuing a career in art history. Born in 1903, Hinks was educated at Westminster School and studied the classical tripos at Trinity College, Cambridge. He spent a year at the British School in Rome under the tutelage of the Romanist Eugenie Strong. In 1926, he was appointed assistant keeper in the Department of Greek and Roman Antiquities in the British Museum <coughs> at the age of only 23. From this comfortable perch, he produced studious catalogs on Greek, Etruscan, and Roman paintings and mosaics, and Greek and Roman portrait sculpture, and a book on Carolingian art. His diaries of the 1930s recount his frequent trips to Germany, intimate friendships with aristocratic women, British diplomats, and, his, and the handsome young Nazis he met in Berlin, and convey an image of Hinks as opinionated and sophisticated beyond his years and at ease in high circles, but fundamentally aloof. Given his owl-like disposition, what happens next comes as a shock. In 1939, when a public scandal erupted over the cleaning of the Parthenon marbles, Hinks was targeted as the fall guy. As a low man on the totem pole, he bore almost no responsibility. But in a vicious tactical maneuver, John Forsdyke, the director of the British Museum, who was in fact liable himself, scapegoated Hinks, who was hauled <coughs> before a board of inquiry and humiliated with a 10 years reduction in seniority and pay and named in parliament. Hinks's diary entries register his sense of disorientation as these events unfold, barely grasping the enormity of what's happening, even as the trustees are coercing him to resign. Looking back a few months later as the crisis died down, he confided, all has been worry and disillusion and horror. John Goldsmith, who edited the diaries, observes of this episode, it was one of the most traumatic events of his life. It left psychological scars and a residue of bitterness, and it permanently changed the direction of his career. He was only 35. Through influential friends, notably, notably Fritz Saxel and Gertrude Bing, he landed briefly at the Warburg Institute, but his career as an art historian effectively stalled. Stationed in the British Embassy in Stockholm during the war, he joined the British Council in 1945, serving as the head of the British Institute in Rome until 1949. In this role, he devised lecture series on such topics as English food, while he feigns pleasure in dispensing with professional expertise and indulging his own bewildered curiosity in English social history, it quickly becomes clear this work is uninspiring and tiresome. To combat frequent bouts of depression, he nurtured his aestheticism. The only cure is to discover some object I had almost said some fetish capable of evoking that world of the imagination which is to me the true reality, he wrote in the diary. In effect, he created an alternate reality, filling the diary with glittering but fragmentary meditations on Baroque Rome, on Piero della Francesca and Giorgione, and tales of his bedside visits with Bernard Berenson at the Villa Itati. In 1946, a London contact threw him a lifeline 
in the form of a commission to write a book about Caravaggio, who was then still a neglected, shadowy figure. When the book appeared in 1953, it coincided with a massive resurgence of interest in the artist following Roberto Longhi's momentous Caravaggio exhibition in Milan in 1951 and Dennis Mahone's series of Burlington Magazine articles from 1951 and 1952. Eschewing academic constraints and drawing on the luminous style of the diary, Hinks set out to write an essay of interpretation and appreciation, a task suited to his talents. As he dug into Caravaggio's legend, a deeper connection emerged between the artist's ill treatment by Rome's counter-Reformation clergy and his own humiliation by the British Museum grandees. He fixed on the crisis in Caravaggio's life surrounding the Carmelites' rejection of the death of the Virgin and the Vatican's rejection of the Madonna de Palafinieri in 1606. Fate seemed against him, Hinks writes in the book. These misadventures were galling. Was he already a back number at 32? That he saw the artist as a kindred spirit is made explicit in a 1954 diary entry. I gave DCM a copy of Caravaggio as an Easter present. I told him he would see the relevance of the story to my own case. Hinks developed an attraction to artists in crisis with whom he could identify. He returned to Caravaggio in a 1956 entry after seeing the Malta beheading of St. John the Baptist at an exhibition in Rome and inspired by Wiley Cipher's recently published Four Stages of Renaissance Style, Hinks classified Caravaggio along with Caracci as a counter-mannerist, a provocative designation difficult to summarize. It was intended to highlight the disintegrative quality of Caravaggio's compositions, as opposed to the reintegrative quality of high Baroque art. But for Hinks, the mannerist element was mainly psychological. These were, oops, these were unbalanced, skeptical, earthbound artists. And what of Anibale Caracci, he asks, surely another case of mannerist nervous collapse. In a further entry, he clarifies his aversion to Rembrandt, a running theme throughout the diaries, except for three works painted on either side of the artist's 1656 bankruptcy. When Hinks describes this episode as the most embarrassed and unsettled moment of Rembrandt's private life, he again recalls his own case and exclaims, how great the consolations of genius in distress can be. In his New Yorker essay about Anthony Blunt, the cleric of treason, George Steiner identifies a bizarre violence in the discipline of art history. Obsessive devotion to inanimate objects and abstruse issues that only a handful of other prying and rival colleagues care about, Steiner argues, can secrete a rare venom into the spirit and foster a pathological need for cruelty this may be a grotesque caricature, but as anyone who's been subject to an anonymous peer review can attest, <laughs> it's not too far off the mark. There's another aspect to this violence having to do with the experience of time. The antiquarian nature of the art historian's work 
produces an estrangement from the present and to some extent from reality. The Mandarin scholar cuts himself off from ordinary humanity. Hinks comes to similar conclusions in the journal he kept in Athens in 1956. In a state close to despair, as he confronts the reality of his life, his illusions about the history of art begin to crack. Reminding himself that he took only a second in the classical tripos at Trinity and that his career at the British Museum ended ignobly, he reflects, as a result of these two failures, I have a resentment against my whole classical education and the false position in which I was placed thereby vis-a-vis -vis classical antiquity. It would have been very much better had I read modern languages at Cambridge, or perhaps better still at Oxford, <laughs> and then gone into the Department of Prints and Drawings, or the V&A. I should be there still and should have become a real scholar and an expert, whereas I now live a life which has no real content, a little less bad than a diplomat's, <laughs> but without some of its solid worldly advantages. Well, it is idle to repine over a misdirected life. For me, this is the climax of the diaries. He admits that the fantasies art engendered were not enough. Yet he clings to the notion that elite institutions hold the key to a fulfilling life. In fact, his story reveals the opposite, that the institutions we revere and that as ambitious young art historians we imagine will rescue us from the realities of our ordinary lives that will catapult us into a rarefied world of beauty and intellect are often lethal and <laughs> ruinous. <laughs> In Athens, Hinks also confronts the reality of being a middle-aged gay man but typically he sublimates his feelings. For example, soon after arriving in Athens, he gives a lecture on Pater's The Renaissance in which he laments afterwards, he failed to convey the central secret sense of what Pater has always meant to me. In one of the diary's most moving entries, he recalls how as a student at Westminster, I found in Pater exactly the voice which echoed aloud my own secret enthusiasm. It sounds like something from Wilde's The Picture of Dorian Gray, but in the context of this British Council lecture, he says it was too personal, too private a meaning to share with an audience of uninformed, indifferent people yet he recognizes it as a failure and realizes that the cultivation of a rich but secret inner life came at the expense of outward authenticity. My pater had hardly a chance to glide out of the dark cupboard where I have kept him all these years, he admits. Certainly a beautiful way of describing life in the closet he didn't share the best parts of himself in his work. Reflecting on Michelangelo's love affair with Tommaso Cavalieri, he identifies with the artist who in his late 50s found a life-affirming Uranian romance. Traveling between Athens and Rome in the late 1950s, he enacts his own personal quarrel of the ancients and the moderns by contrasting his bitter disillusion with Athens and rage against the Philhellenes with his enthrallment with Rome. It is this interweaving of historical destinies, this secular experience of abounding and being abased 
and then abounding again that I find so enthralling in Rome, he swoons. What he's describing is his ability to experience the continuity of history in Rome, whereas in Athens he feels estranged by the discontinuity of the ancient amid the squalid modern city. There are parallels here to Winkelmann in his yearning for a sublime experience expressed in terms of sexual ecstasy and mediated through classical antiquity. To abound and be abased, to return to Steiner's point, this is the language of sadism. After the despairing Athens interlude, Hinks found greater equilibrium. The remainder of the diary from 1959 to 1963 documents his many glamorous travels between Venice, Paris, London, and Madrid, visiting friends and seeing art. This is one of the most art-filled sections of the diaries, careening between periods and styles, often in the same entry. The last entry in the published diary finds him in the Academia in Venice. Anyway, to be entirely alone in the St. Ursula room for half an hour today. Quelle joie. The diaries in total present a way of doing art history, divorced from institutions, where the meaning of art is joined to human drama. As a result of his own adventures, or misadventures, as it were, Hinks finally understood that this was the more meaningful exploration. It was in this last brief period of his life that he came closest to realizing a project he envisioned years earlier in 1947 and which he called simply the book. An autobiography of enjoyment, variations on a theme of the inward eye, which is the bliss of solitude. Of course, the diary is that book. And Kenneth Clark is right. It is literature. Thanks. Um, fascinating. Thank you so much to all three of our speakers uh, for, their, um, um, for their presentations. I'm sure there are many questions in the room. Can I just start with, I think, more a little observation about something that I found strikingly tying all three papers together. And that is the fact that many of these careers that we have been looking at, not just today, but also think of Ope yesterday, had this strange split between the desired real life that somebody wants to achieve and the actual life that they have to live. These, the, the, this almost Janus phase element to, to much of their work. Williamson seemed to, be have, seemed to have been quite at ease with himself, but still I found the striking difference between this very academic work on miniatures and the more popular art writing that he published in editorial capacity. I mean, in, in Hinks's case, I think it's fairly obvious how, how, these, uh, how, how this disillusionment with institutions uh, created this, this almost internal split. But also, I think clearly in your case, there was, of course, a serious academic credential behind all three of these women that in many of these cases was not able to be actually lived uh, in, in their professional capacity. So I'm wondering to what extent all three of you see that as a problem of institutions, as in the case of Hinks perhaps, or indeed in the other two cases maybe of the lack of institutions. To, to what degree uh, are these unifying frameworks for an existence, a help or a hindrance for these biographies that we've been looking at? I don't know if you want to, or whether you all want to re respond to that. Or... Um, I... I have a few thoughts, yes, uh, and I agree with you that it's, it's all connected. Um, um, and it's also heavily gendered uh, in the cases that I presented. Um, there, there is a, the, it's, the reality isn't that these uh, women would have found a prestigious position in, in German-speaking countries 
um, that easily in any case. Um, so it's not like they, they had illusions that were then smashed uh, when they came. They were already facing a certain uh, differentiated reality to their male counterparts having to assert their uh, right to study in universities. It's only very uh, recently that um, all these degrees were open to them, so uh, they were still in the pioneering phase um, when they had to leave Germany. So they had to come to terms with almost a double uh, mm -hmm. loss. The institutions that they left would never, would never have been as welcoming to caricature, you know, the gender discrepancy uh, as they were uh, to their male uh, colleagues anyway. Um, but they came to terms uh, with the loss in different ways, adapting and, and changing gear, or mourning and, and being constantly, uh, sadly, frustrated. So it's more like, a, yes, the absence of institutions and the absence of opportunities to uh, create a new institution for oneself in some cases. I think, well, um, thinking about Williamson, I think in a way it was, there was, he was never really challenged. I mean, that, that in a way, that's the absence of an institution. But he managed to, through publishing so much, of, you know, he was publishing a couple of books a year, quite apart from the Morgan catalogues. Um, he sort of set himself up as an expert and... Nobody really challenged. There is one um, review in the Athenaeum of his um, first book on uh, Russell, the pastel painter, which, which does contain you know, quite a few um, references to the inaccuracy of some of the historical material there. But apart from that review, there's very little criticism. And so he was able to sort of perpetuate this myth of his own expertise, really. And I think what happened was he became so tied up in, in the collection of, in the Morgan collection and the amount of money at his disposal to, to really acquire things for that collection. Um, and he sort of run away with his own importance. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, which creates an echo chamber in its own right. Yes, you're exactly. You're the only person and because who yes, everything revolves. yes, and because yeah. he's not in an academic yeah. framework, there's nobody there saying to him, "Well, hang <laughs> on." <you know." laughs> yes. I think it's a wonderful question, and one that's not often <laughs> asked. Um, I think for me, I'm still like under the influence of the Steiner essay. You know, and, um, you know, he, he talks about this dynamic that exists not just in art history, but uh, within the humanities more generally, and he contrasts it with work in the sciences. Um, I mean, we'd really have to test his argument, I think, but I think there's something to it. And, um, mm -hmm. Yeah. We've got numerous questions, I think. I've always been fascinated by people who like to be called doctor. Um, I think beginning with Dr. Johnson, for whom there's no evidence that he had a doctorate, and um, the great archaeologist of uh, County Durham, uh, um, William Greenwell, who was called Canon Greenwell as well as Dr. Greenwell, but he was neither a canon, full canon, um, nor a doctor. Um, and Dr. Williamson, who wrote an autobiography called the tales and stories of an expert, um, um, clearly not lacking in self-confidence. Um, how did he get away with it, do you think? How did you establish that he was not a doctor? And um, I mean, didn't people like Morgan wonder about his expertise, what it was founded on? Well, apparently not. No. <laughs> um, it's very hard for us to sort of conceived now of how you could just get away with that. But I think he, just by self-declaration, you know, he declared himself to be Dr. Williamson. And he some, sometimes he puts um, Dr. Williamson, sometimes he puts um, D. Lit, or even Lit D. Um, uh, but it appears to be his own invention. And it um, it's, it's interesting because he wrote three memoirs altogether, and 
you know, he never he never says anything really, anything about his education. Could I just ask a second question too? Um, did he ever write um, the authentications for paintings? Was he employed by dealers at all um, to? Um, Not really, um, no, yeah. no. I think it, he's a, he's a bit before that period, really. Yeah, no, a fascinating story about former qualifications going back also to, to Opes, the origin of the <laughs> M. Phil of uh, Loshak yesterday. It seems to be a bigger story to be told. Yeah. Um, can I just follow up on Nigel's point about, about Williamson? Because his, his ex, the, his, what, what he seems to be claiming as his real expo, expertise was less on paintings, which he, where he wrote popular books, have I got this wrong, mm -hmm. but more on, on small-scale um, material, Klein plastique and jewellery and so on. Yes. And that's what the big... I always thought there was an inverse relationship between the, the, the smallness of the objects and the largeness of the books. <laughs> <laughs> um, but but, but, the, but, but in, in a sense, he was presumably developing some sort of... Um, appearance of expertise, anyhow, in these areas. Presumably that, that has to do with the, the art trade. I'm thinking of, you know, the sale of the Spitzer collection and, and, and salting, buying things from Spitzer, and that, that whole world, and, and the, the, the interest in, in, in those small-scale objects. Mm -hmm. um, and, and presumably that's drawing on sort of German scholarship. But did he have any German? Not as far as I know. No, no. He, he, you're right, though. That that's he, a sort of missing, did, miss something yes, missing. He, there. he did focus on on, yeah. on small. After Russell, so Russell was his sort of book on bigger pictures. Really. Yes. Yeah. Which is, I think, again, interesting to think about the popular art history that seems to have a very different domain than, say, his serious work about uh, miniatures and so on. So more in the, in the, thing of the English home and country life uh, style, which seems to have its own genre. One over here, that's uh, oh, so, uh, oh, sorry, one online. Um, I've studied Williamson as soon as for a very long time, um, and... Uh, found quite a lot about him. I learnt a lot in your excellent paper. Um, the miniature Roy Strong told, told me is in the b and collection. And he once gave a lecture where he compared himself to this, that very portrait miniature. And of course, if you look at his most recent book, one of the portraits is of him wearing a... Yeah. 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 Um, and of course, Hughes, a, I mean, Roy Strong is an academic and a very distinguished museum director still with us, but he was also very much a showman. And I think Williamson was a showman. There are letters by him in the Duke of Buccleuch's archive, which I know very well. They're the most extraordinary performances of flattery and snobbery and self-professed expertise. In no way can, um, can Williamson be considered an academic. He was a great um, compiler of lists. I mean, and this mm. is, the, is the great feature of all his books. And he's also a fantastic snob in his books, where he describes meeting all the, the titled owners that he meets. Um, but um, Blythe Sobel, who's the assistant curator at the um, Nelson Atkins Museum in Kansas City, where I've been recently doing, a, doing some work on the miniatures there, a great collection, she has seen all the letters in the Morgan Library, um, and she's doing some work on them. And he was rumbled, he was for fakes, and also for overcharging. And the, <laughs> the brilliant librarian there, there's been a lot of work on her, she's the black librarian who passed as white, um, Belle de Costa Green, she was the one who rumbled him, and that then got to Morgan. And he did die in 1913, and so he was, his services were terminated. Um, so there's an incredibly interesting story. It is very interesting that that does kind of finish at that moment. Um, he does continue to do these books after, after, the, after the Second World War. What my real question is, is what happened to his own collection? Um, because it was exhibited, um, you know, uh, during the First World War, and it, uh, he also had a very important collection. He seemed to acquire things from places that he visited and researched in. I, can't, I mean, I can't, I can't add to that. I don't, I don't know what happened to his pictures. Mm -hmm. Quality of snobbery clearly is also a recurring theme, though. I think yeah, that is striking yeah. that somebody like Hinks also clearly modelled himself, probably to a degree, on 
extravagant characters that populated the scene before him already? What would yeah. you think? Yeah. My sense of Hinks is that he was quite um, a buttoned up, kind of muted character, but very opinionated and um, within his his circle of friends, and he was very much a part of of you know a certain set. Um, I mean, he he. I mean, the extraordinary thing about the story for me is that he he comes out of the old boys club. I mean, he's one of them, and um, I mean, he's sort of you know handpicked at the age of twenty three, um, and set on a track at the British Museum. And in the diary, as the scandal around the cleaning of the marbles is unfolding, he, um, and as I said, he's disoriented. It's very clear to the reader that he's being pushed out and that he's being scapegoated. But even as that's happening, he's still imagining that he can become, eventually become keeper of <coughs> Greco-Roman antiquities. Like, he, it's not dawning on him that you know, he, he's being pushed off the cliff. So, you know, what I'm saying, Hans, to your, to your point, is like he's, he's, you know, one of the old boys, and um, it only, he, he like slowly awakens to the fact, and, and comes out of this sort of culture of snobbery, and, you know, event, you know has this awakening uh, at this moment. Um, and it does sort of disabuse him to a certain extent um, of, you know, the culture mm -hmm. uh, in which he's come out of. Mm -hmm. But yes, absolutely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I've got a question online. Yes, this is from someone online. It's, um, I think, more of a comment, and it came in, Emily, during your um, presentation. Um, and um, the person, David, uh, says, I see some parallels in the immediate post-war years and up to the late 1960s with the writing then on sculpture produced in Britain between the 17th and the 19th centuries. And we're doing some spanning of... Oh, and I'm very sorry, the, the zoo um, has just gone down. <laughs> so we will <laughs> maybe leave that um, tantalising comment hanging and um, if it comes back on, then I can... Um, <laughs> It's actually going into, I was saying, it's very Malcolm Baker territory. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. yeah. Uh, we, 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 it's, it's just the sort of um, the, the regrettable absence of, 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 of Becky Senior, who I'm sure we're talking about. Mrs. Esther would have, but but I, I I was thinking in terms of the the, the, the role of of of, of women um, in, in in British art history, and so so there there are your um, emigres, um, but then there are also a number of women like Margaret Longhurst at the V&A and um, Mary Shamo writing about enamels and Mrs. Christie writing about. Opus Anglicanum and so on. Um, so they, they weren't. They weren't. They, they they were writing important, significant works, but they weren't writing about painting. Mm -hmm. yeah. So it's as if there was a space for women to writing things that were a, a, a somewhat marginal, yes. um, relatively so. But I, um, I, I don't know whether. But was there any contact between um, your um, emigre women and, and these people in these other institutions? Um, as far as I can tell, yes, uh, through uh, networks of, so, right. as, as a Hilde and Otto Kurz mm -hmm. uh, yeah. often worked as a couple, in, indeed, they, they co wrote things, uh, and, but so through Otto, she had connections with, with the Warburg yeah. Institute. And uh, Gertrude Bing and other other people uh, navigating around it, yes. um, but she ne never had an official entry. Even though she did manage to publish some of scholarly work, Hilda Kurz never got a position officially and a title, right. as opposed to to her partner. Right. Yeah. But it's yes, we are barely scratching the surface of this topic. So I'm going to ask you to repeat that list <laughs> later <laughs> on. And uh, yes, Marie Chameau indeed is one of our. Uh, so I completely agree that they were uh, looking at topics that had been left um, sort of uncovered before, but also 
Um, in terms of geographical areas, um, they were, so Marie Chameau in particular, so th there was work on Russian art, for instance, that had not been done in, uh, um, so they brought uh, their contribution to scholarship also by bringing to the surface um, other artistic movements and regions. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that chimes very much with, I can see the comment back and the names that are mentioned. And I know, again, Becky, this connects with Becky Senior's um, work and um, saying, um, again, this work on um, sculpture of the 17th and 19th centuries, um, dominated by three remarkable women, Catherine Estale uh, on the Biliac, yeah. um, Marjorie Webb on Risebrack, and um, uh, Margaret Winnie of the Courtauld Institute on Sculpture in, in Britain more generally, mm -hmm. um, and saying, you know, Ru Rupert Gunnis, who might have been described as a gentleman scholar, compiled the famous dictionary of sculptors mm -hmm. in Britain, but that was more of a list of works, and I think we're getting, again, we, we've heard of that, that phrase used today as well, what kind of, what kind of of art history are we talking about? Um, whereas you know, these work of these women was was something um, a little bit different, yes. and it'd be interesting to explore again their role and working on a marginalised field of British art um, that came to be the province of these uh, women. Absolutely, yes. Uh, thank you for a person online, and thank you for your comments as well. I would add to it. So I, I tried through a glimpse at the book on popular art to hint at the fact that they were also pioneering the study of design uh, and, and uh, crafts. Uh, and I would mention Helen Rosenau's work on architectural history as well as yeah. new and groundbreaking. Uh, yeah. When Pesner arrived to Britain, he deplored the absence of art history, but even more so the absence of his field as the history of architecture. And indeed, was an hour's work on, um, on French uh, architecture, on Boulet, was, was groundbreaking mm -hmm. at this time. Which is a fascinating point, because a lot of this material on these, these lower genres, of course, also harks back to a more, say, antiquarian tradition, as it was often pejoratively called, mm -hmm. which indeed has a very strong and important standing in Britain, especially also in the regions, you know, where you have surveys of all the different counties, all the people who rob some inscriptions and um, document what, what's there. So this this attempt at list making on from a from a bottom up level is is clearly very established in on, on these aisles. Um, and the more professional scholarship then, such as the ones you've mentioned, seem to continue on that track. But yeah, it's actually striking that the high art, the fine art, the painting Department that that seems to be the one that that remains left out, which is which is a quite quite peculiar British um, <laughs> omission, I guess, in the canon of uh, art history. Even even Hinks, you know, comes from classics, of course, so it has a different training that brings him to the subject. Can, can I just add one thing about? Sorry. Oh right. Okay. Yeah. Uh, just one thing about Hinks. I mean, what, what, there's a question and a comment actually. What, what, what was part of the, the 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 way he 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 was the fall guy in in the in in the British Museum cleaning scandal. Were, were, was there an element of homophobia there? It was that because he 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 was he he, he was um, perceived as not. He may have been one of us in terms of his background, but not otherwise. Um, and and the, the, that, that's the question. The comment is that, that the way he's been sort of forgotten, um, uh, I, I, he wrote an article in a French journal about Rubiliac's Shakespeare. And it, it isn't even included in uh, Aileen Dawson's wonderful and, and very thorough catalogue of, of portrait sculpture in the BM. It seems to have missed, been missed. It's as if, the, it, I'm not saying she did that, she certainly didn't do it deliberately, but, but, but it was as if he disappeared, even in terms of publications like that. Yes, I think you very well could be onto something. I mean, I don't have a, an answer, a specific answer, but I think absolutely um, there might have been some, you know, homophobia at play. If, if not that word, I would say that it seems reasonable to say that uh, John Forsdyke kind of identified a, a weakness in Hinks's character, a personality that he felt he could, you know, use. Yeah. Um, and 
this comes out in the diary. I mean, there is a certain sort of sadio, sadomasochistic kind of strain that comes out in Hinks's personality. And I've wondered if, you know, Forrest Dyke and some of the other um, bigwigs at the British Museum kind of identified this character trait and, and used it and sort of pushed it. Um, so that's absolutely, I would say, you're onto something there. Could I just add a comment that um, I'm not sure where I have read this or um, whether it was in Kenneth Clark or whatever, but um, I have a strong sense that the um, scapegoating of Hinks um, was very much recognized at the time, and uh, there, were, there, there was a, a sense that something must be done for him, that he had been very unfairly treated. And the sort of phrase that comes to my mind is that he was um, friends found him a post with the British Council as um, a, at least something to keep Bobby and so on together. Um, that, that, that was quite widespread support for him um, over the uh, um, basically being the fall guy for Ashmo and others. Yes, um, that's true. Um, Clark, uh, Kenneth Clark was you know, a patron of his, and as events were unfolding, it was very clear to, to, to people within the circle that, you know, he was being scapegoated, and there was a, a kind of drive to find him a position, which is how he lands at the Warburg Institute. He takes up Anthony Blunt's spot. Uh, Blunt moved just at that moment to the Courtauld, uh, so Hinks moves to the Warburg um, to take up Blunt's spot. Uh, Betsy Sears has written a wonderful article on that particular episode. Um, and then he's at the, at the Warburg for less than a year, and um, other friends, you know, sort of move him into the direction of the British Council. It's very interesting because he feels, Hinks feels at this moment, this is around December 1940, he wants to bring uh, Warburgian principles and techniques uh, to bear on the British Council's work. And as the war progresses, he begins to, you know, he, I feel like he tries to convince himself that the British Council will have a large role to play, you know, in the rebuilding of, you know, European civilization uh, after the war. Um, my, my take, again, is that he's really kind of trying to convince himself of, of this and to create a sense of importance around the work because once he takes up the post in Rome in 1945 it very quickly becomes clear that he you know it, it just sends him into to, you know a depressed depressive episodes and it, it's not the kind of grand uh, work that he had imagined but you are correct I think we've got uh, one or two more questions online, and then I think we... No, no, no. no actually, no, we're, we're good. We're good? No more questions then online, okay. In that case, uh, we have one last question in the room, and... Um, Thank you. Here's the microphone. Thank you. Could I um, just re revert to, to Hinks? Um, I, by chance, done some work on his father, whose own career is kind of, I mean, it, it, Hinks recapitulates his father's dodgy career with respect to the Astronomical Society and then the Royal Geographical Society. So I'm wondering to what extent he sees this sort of difficulty in finding a secure place within an institution as a personal familial mm. um, a, a, a difficulty. I mean, obviously, Arthur Hinks is involved with manly things like astronomy and Everest and so on, and and so there's and 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 is married and heterosexual, so there's no sort of really intimate um, problem there. But nonetheless, there's this sort of thing that your your own trajectory, which has seemed so secure in a, in an institution of note, becomes um, imperiling. Thanks. I'm so glad you mentioned that. Uh, there were so many other details I wish I could have included, and that was one of them. Um, Hinks's father, as you said, Arthur Hinks, was the secretary of the Royal Ast Astronomy S Astronomical Society and was pushed out of that role, I think, in 1913. Um, and it was a very messy, nasty business. Uh, and he then, too, 
kind of found a soft landing. He became the secretary of the Royal Geographical Society. Interestingly, this doesn't come up in Hinks's diaries. I thought it, it would. Um, he, he seeks his father's advice, you know, as he's going through this experience, but there's no acknowledgement in the diaries, at least, that his, his father had, you know, kind of suffered a similar fate. But I, I also, you know, noticed the similarity and found it remarkable. But I, you know, it'd be interesting to, to look a bit more into it um, if there were letters or something like a little tidbit that creates in the documents that creates the connection. Fascinating. There are indeed many broader, longer time frames and stories still to be covered, and I'm sure we can cover some of them in the afternoon in our final round table. Uh, I'd like to thank our three speakers again. Um, before we all make our way downstairs for a little comfort break, and down there we will then uh, distribute the group uh, to have a little tour of the study room where you will have an opportunity to see some more uh, um, um, objects from the OPE archive and library, but also for those who wish to get another tour of the drawing room display, which uh, I'm sure many of you have already uh, um, studied intently and which of course uh, resonates very closely to some of the papers we heard yesterday. So thank you again to our speakers and to all of you for your questions and indeed stamina over the last two hours. Um, thank you. Thank you.